Hey, okay. Hear me. This works. This works. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Yit from the Android Framework team. I'm actually excited for this talk. Like, I don't usually get excited for talks, but um, <laughs> it's in London. It's interesting. Okay. So, uh, this year at I.O., we released these architecture components, and I was the technical lead for that. And I wanted to, like, it was a very different experience for us, too. We really never did a project this way. And I wanted to share some information, like some behind the scenes, how we developed this project. And also, some of the decisions we made are not really straightforward. So I wanted to share them, like give some background information why certain decisions were made. <clears throat> so the reason we started this project was that like the Android development is hard. If you ask anybody, it's, it's considered one of the harder things. And as anything in life, is actually some good parts of this and some bad parts of this. So if you look at it, for example, there's some pros, right? You have very good job security. If you're, <laughs> If you're a good Android engineer, you will have a job like for the upcoming at least five, ten years. That's guaranteed. Five. <laughs> if you learn machine learning, then it's done. It's the AI driven world. The other good thing is like we get paid pretty well, like at least compared to other engineers. I know in London, like the finance people get paid more, I guess, but it's still good for engineers too. Uh, but it's, it's not all that great. There's some negative aspects, like it's the, it decreases the application quality in the platform, right? Because it's harder to do the right thing, less people do the right thing, which means for the end user, the person who buys the phone, their experience is not great because applications are crashing. Another part of the problem is, is the high enter barrier, like, can you hear me if I don't use mic? No. No, no. no. okay. <laughs> All right, now it's not. <laughs> I ask, I type. Uh, this one, no, I will probably move. So. <laughs> so the other part is the higher entry barrier. Like, if you, it's writing hard, you're going to start with something easy. So people will not be developing for Android, which makes it bad for the future of the platform. Like, Android development should be able easy. Should be able to start with Android development. And now with this question, like around one year ago, we went to CAP. So now CAP stands for Customer Advisory Board. This is a group of external developers where like in a, once in a couple of months we get together and we ask about the future of Android, we ask about their problems. It's a group where we get external feedback. And now we ask them like, what's hard about Android development? We think it's very easy. And they said, this is that, this is that, this is that, like it's like, <laughs> It actually continues because they affect the slides. So it was very sad. And we're like, fine. I mean, that's OK. And, but like, these are people, like, I mean, Jake is there. Like, these are people are working like Uber, Amex. Like, they, they work in pretty big companies. Uh, they have high requirements. And we want to talk to everybody, not just these people. So we met with like teachers, contractors, agencies, students. Like, we talked to people from very different groups and we asked the same question, like what's hard with your Android experience? And in that case, there was like similar problems. It was actually less. Maybe because they were doing something wrong but they never realized it or <laughs> made their problem easier. And like one of the interesting things like this came up and when we were talking to university, like threads are hard. And I, I was like, how come threads like, is very fundamental, but if you think about it, it's a very hard concept, and if you are doing web development, if you are doing server-side development, you never, almost never deal with threads. Like they don't exist in your daily life. Versus in Android, it's a major part of your program. It defines your architecture, it defines a lot of things. And okay, this was said too. But like in one of these meetings, there was a quote, which I was so surprised, but they, now I understand it better. Like someone said, "I don't want to deal with technical things." <laughs> Remind me, this person is an engineer. And, uh, and I was like, how come? Like, because this is what we like, right? Like, you're all here instead of being somewhere else because you enjoy this topic. But that person is the reality. He said, I just want to deliver the project. 
Like that should be possible. Like just to be able to write a good Android uh, application, you don't need to be reading a new blog post every day. Like s stuff like if you're just trying to finish up something, that should be feasible. Yeah, like if you really like it, write the best application. That's great, we have a community around it. But getting started is really hard. So we went back, back to work, like we're depressed. So we started, okay, like how do you solve this problem? Because you saw the list is too, too long, like there's no way we'll get to that. So we came up with some, like the basic things. So we said, okay, we need to focus on the fundamentals. By the way, we believe, I guess the Android framework, we believe the Android framework is actually very good. Like as an operating system, the contracts between applications, the way they can speak to each other, but they are still very well isolated. Actually, that model is very good. We believe the problem happens as soon as you, wanna, you want to build something on top of it. It's just like the wild, wild west. Like you have no idea what to do. Uh, so we say we're going to focus on these fundamentals and we're going to make them better. We're going to play well with others. Like the community already solved a bunch of problems. So if you're coming with a solution, it should either be one of these existing solutions or whatever we call it, it should play well with the existing solutions. Like, like we, don't, we never wanted to have this not invented here syndrome because we already have a lot of work to do. And we wanted to be opinionated. The hard part about framework development is that like, you write these widgets or components in a way that like people might use them in a like, hundred different ways. You always try to make up these scenarios on my mind, on your mind and try to support them, which makes it very hard. Uh, so we said, okay, we will be opinionated. Like if we think that something is wrong, we are not going to try to support it, which makes it e easier to provide better, more consistent APIs. Scale is another thing. Like we get this uh, negative feedback a lot where like we have all these classes. They were great the first time you used them. And as soon as you try to change it, you need to rewrite it. Uh, we don't like that. So whatever solutions we provide, we want them to be okay in the first time your application and still stay there in the upcoming years. Uh, reach is the other part, like we can we can change the framework luckily, but like that doesn't help. If we cannot just do things in the Android O and uh, tell everybody to target Android O. That that wouldn't be a realistic solution. So we need it to be backward, we need to come up with a backward compatible solution. And the last but not least is being more practical, more pragmatic. Sometimes like we focus on out on engineering and there is a good so like a ninety percent good solution that's easier to get and then this like hundred percent perfect solution. We said, okay, we'll start optimizing for ninety percent as well because we we wanna think about realistic. Like like that guy said, like he wants to finish the project, that should be the main goal. So what we come up with, I mean there's a lot of problems we know, so but we needed to start somewhere. So we said we are going to embrace life cycles. Like life cycles are not going anywhere. They're not going to disappear. So we can make it easier to use. Similar, like the persistent story on Android is horrible. Whatever we have out of the box is so, so complex, we needed to provide something better. And the architecture guidance, this is something we always said, you know what, do whatever you do, as long as you talk properly with the rest of the OS, we are fine. And that didn't work very well. So we said, okay, we should do provide some guidance and if someone like if someone wonders there should be an answer if they want to do what they want to do we are, we are cool with that and there's this fool now this is actually a real project his name is not fool but uh, this was something we started but we realized we're not going to finish it before IO so we removed it from the repository uh, I, I want to keep it here because I want to show like Architecture components is a like ongoing effort. Like we will keep working on this. It's not a one-off thing. Uh, so most stuff is coming. But uh, let's look at like how we decide to embrace the life cycles and like why. And then the question is, why are life cycles a problem? And to understand that, if you look at where people start development, like many people start developing on the web, and like to get started on the web is super easy. You just Take your file, change the extension to HTML, you can open it in your browser. It's, it's very easy. On Android, I mean, as long as you can like wait for Android Studio to download everything, is you just hit next, next, next. Like getting a hello world is also reasonably easy in Android Studio. It just takes time. But like if you want to fetch and display some data, which is like the next thing you will try to do, it's still very easy on the web. On Android, it's quite tricky. Like, 
this is what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not saying this is good code, but this is the code you write for the first time you write this. Just makes an eject request, sends a URL, whatever the response comes, just puts it inside the there. Like, and that works, works very well. And we can write the same code in Android, right? You can get the view, you know, fetch it when the response comes, set something. Like, you can do the same on Android, except it's actually broken, right? <laughs> Because if you care, you realize this code actually doesn't handle the life cycle. So like if, if it comes after the activities are created, and then whatever you call you make here, needs a fragment transaction is going to crash. So this is a problem we want to solve. This should be easy. But how do you fix it? So you need to like keep a reference to the request somewhere. You know, when you, you start tracking it across your code, like when it's stopped, you need to cancel it. This is what we say the boilerplate code, and we don't want this. Like th this is dummy code that doesn't make any sense for you to write. This should be somewhat automatic. Uh, so about focusing on the fundamentals, we said okay, embracing the life cycles. We, we said okay, like, you know what? The easiest thing is make these things observable, right? Activity already has all these events, but if we just make it observable, so people can write components that observe these things. And then we say, okay, but there needs to be an automatic lifecycle handling. Even to, to write the component, you need to understand it. But we're still trying to also focus for that person who just started Android. They have no idea what lifecycle. We want their code not to crash. So when we look at the activity or fragment, you, you know, we have all these callbacks. So they expect, okay, these are like the states. But if you look at the reality, if you look at activity manager or the fragment manager code base, they are not the states. They are like the edges between states. The actual states are well, where you go after you go through that method. We weren't sure, like, so the reality is those, like, these yellow ones are the states, and these are the events. But we were not sure if people understand this. And we were talking to Big North Ranch, which is a company that they give education, they write books. And we asked them, do people understand this difference? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we teach people. Like, there's these states are the nodes in a graph, and the events are the edges between those graphs. It's easy to understand. OK, like, fine. We said, oh, we will embrace it, because it's the truth anyways. And then once we have these states, it's much easier to explain. Like, if you are resume, user is using that activity or fragment. If you are started, you're still visible. You just don't have the focus. And if you are create and initialize, you're just not visible to the user. And if you are destroyed, you're gone. Like you're just waiting to be garbage collected unless you leak yourself. Uh, but this is this is so much easier. I mean, this is more or less is three states. You're either visible with focus, without focus, or you're not visible. That's much easier to explain in many cases. And when we wanted to make these classes observable, let's say this activity was something in your code base. You would just do this, right? You would add a like observe method or add observe method into the activity. You start observing it, which we luckily we have the ability to change the activity source code. But if we do that, it will be only API 26 plus. Basically, none of you will be here. Like, that wouldn't work. I mean, uh, so we could say like we come up with this lifecycle owner interface. And then you can say, OK, everybody just implement this interface. So you will need to all this dispatching yourself. This will technically work, but like, it will be very impractical because you need to write these activities. And like, we don't want people to overwrite on stop, on start anymore. So if you had to overwrite it, that means we failed. So your question, well, like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make the easy things easy. So it should be very easy to attach to the life cycle of a fragment or activity. And the harder things should be possible. So in terms of making easy things easy, well, like you can just provide this life cycle activity. You extend that one and you're done, uh, which is a solution. But it's actually not a great solution because maybe you want to extend from app compat activity and Java doesn't support multiple inheritance. Like that will be really hard. We still provide that, but we provide another solution. like. That looks very similar, where you can implement this other interface and I hold on to a variable for us. And then we will do all the plumbing for you. So if, if you create an activity that implements this lifecycle registry owner, then it's going to start dispatching all of its lifecycle events without you overriding any of the on start, on stop, whatever. 
So it's like a finer balance. And now you can make any activity, a life cycle activity with four lines of code, and then we think that's a fair compromise. And I, I think this solution gives us like a hundred percent reach. And like coming to this solution actually take, took out of iterations for us. Yeah. And now we want to make the hard things possible. Like what's the hard thing? For example, there are libraries like Conductor uh, where like they don't use fragments. They have some a fragment replacement library. And for this reason, it should be possible if you have your own fragment library, you should be able to implement this interface as well. So like you just say I implement lifecycle loaner and then use the other class we provide. Now this is work, this is not an easy work, like the library owner needs to do this, but it's still doable and then everything that works with this lifecycle interface start working with that library as well, which uh, makes it really nice for the platform. And like we, we wanted to make some pragmatic choices. Like one example of this, let's say you have a code like this where you have an observer on an activity does something when the on stop is called. And you also have the activity itself, which does something when the on stop is called. And now, if I ask you which one is called first, like, what would you guess? Normally, in, a, like in an observer pattern, if you want to notify observers about the change, the object itself would first change its state, and then you tell the observers about it. So normally in that pattern you will be like calling activity first and not the observer. But instead we actually call the observer first and then the activity. And this, this is a very like practical choice because most of the time in that observer you have a code like this. Like when it's stopped, you you wanna know the activity is stopped, and then you probably check that in somewhere and then call the activity. And such code could end up in situations where like activity on stop runs. And then activity receives another callback after on stop, which is usually the, you know, all that fragment transaction exceptions you receive all because of this problem. Something calls you after your activity is stopped. So like, so practically we should really call the listener. So we are calling the listener. Uh, but is the right opposite in the, when you are going the upwards direction, when you're like on create, on start, on resume, we first call the activity so that it brings itself to that state then we tell the observer because you really want the activity or the fragment to be in that state. So for those ones, activity receives the callback first. And when you are going downwards, then we call the observers first so they, they clean up before the activity. They're not going to call the activity by mistake. And like for, from a just like pure computer science perspective, it looks a really weird rule, but it's practically this what you want, so we, we optimize for it. And if you go back to our first example, there's the one like you could write the same web code but it's broken. We want this to be possible. You know, you just pass a life cycle and after that this code is not broken anymore. I'm not saying it's a good code, but it's not broken. Like this is, this is a very, very big difference. So like, and then this person will eventually, as they write more applications or spend more time, they will learn how to architect it better. But their first code should run properly as well so that they will spend more time in the platform. They will keep learning instead of, oh, this Android is so hard, like I don't, I'll go with some other solution. Uh, so in, in the persistence, this is a similar area. Like there's plenty of solutions. There's like lots of ORMs, we provide SQLite, and then there's companies like RAM, which comes with a like totally different solution. Uh, it's nice, but like what is out of the box is really horrible. So we wanted to make it better. And we're basically trying to decide, okay, we either pick one of these solutions and bless it, which is like similar to what we do with retrofit. We just tell people to use retrofit. We're going to tell people to use one of these solutions. Or we're going to write something ourselves. And the first question that comes to mind if you look at all these solutions, do we want to use an ORM or not? And if you like take one step uh, further and they say, what are we trying to achieve? We're just trying to close the gap between Java and the database. Uh, while doing this, we don't want to enforce things like base class. So we want it to be like as external as possible, as decoupled as possible from your code base. Uh, it should be something convenient, like this is a problem with the built-in solution or like things like content providers, it's just out of code. Uh, it should be predictable 
So if you have a library, this is one problem where ORMs have, where like you, you call some method, you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. So you get all these unexpected failures. And it should be efficient, which is like, we went with SQLite, SQLite is like fairly fast. So as long as we don't abstract it too much, we knew that it was going to be fast. So, okay, we, and then the size actually really, really matters in this case. Like we couldn't ask everybody to ship a binary with their applications that's going to add like another couple megabytes because things like the, you know, the next billion users, these are very important things. Users are very important. So keeping the size of the library small is actually an important thing for us. So I said, okay, uh, let's look at some more examples. So it's like, okay, we're trying to pick, like I literally went through almost every existing ORM and like play with them. And you will see examples like this, like this is something we don't like. So I create this organization object, it said something and then call save. Like, where is it even saving? Like, how, how do you know where it is saving? Like, where is the abstraction? I totally lost it. Say I could create the object and save it without telling it where to save. And this, like, try to test this, try to change where it saves. It's going to be a horrible experience. So we don't like it. We want these things to be more explicit. So let's say if you want to use the framework APIs, which is the content values, now, like, you're calling it on the database. You need to explicitly give That's a good API. Except what is this? Like, some string and null, which I have no idea what it is, and a content values object. I'm trying to put an organization object into the database. I should be able to put that one into the database. So I lost all the like compile time checks. It's not great either. There's like one more example is this, how do you retrieve the data back? Like, this is a very simple query, and is this like three and a half lines of really very hard to read thing. It's not great. Like the SQLite equivalent of this is like, it's very easy to read if you know SQL. Uh, so we're like, okay, what if we use SQL? So when you use, try to do the same query with SQL, now it starts returning you a cursor. Like, I am trying to grab an organization. So like, it's really nice to use the SQL APIs, but as soon as you start using them, then you lose the Java. If you stop, you move to Java, then things like querying looks really ugly. Like, it's a very hard balance. So we're like, why don't we take the best of both worlds? So we're going to say, we're going to let you write SQL because it's, it's very concise, it's very descriptive, but we are going to map it back to Java for you. And which gives us like a lot of power. So these were the two things we wanted to get. And like we came up with this idea for room, or like we can provide this. And at around like February, we had another camp meeting where we presented these like very early prototypes or the design docs of, of these projects with the same camp members and we asked them, we asked a lot of questions. And so about Room, there was also a questionnaire, like there's all these features we thought about developing and we asked them like, which ones are important for you? And every attendee gets this uh, pins, like green and red pins, or they can put on these projects and they need to put all of them. So it's like, we try to understand what is more important. It's like one of the things was the, doing the query verification at compile time it's like everyone said, yes, this is important for us, do it. Uh, migration support, like I personally thought migrations are not that important. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> it was like, no, like it's very important. So we, we prioritize that. Like uh, this uh, phase of like asking developers very early on stage helped us a lot. This was very new for the framework. And the Java Query Builder API. But well, we were going to write the Java Query Builder API because people love ORM, so people, we thought people want that. And the camp member said no. Like, I will give more details about that. That was also surprising. Uh, this was another question, like, Android Studio understanding SQL. They said, yeah, so these two things basically tell us we don't want the Query Builder API, we want Studio to do it. It's like, it is the IDE's job to help you write that SQL. By creating builders around it, we're not really making it easier. And we had this other thing where relationships, where we have some strong opinions, and the cap said implemented, and we didn't really do that. Also mentioned. <laughs> so I mean, like, we listen, but doesn't, we don't blindly listen. We have some ideas to so try to merge this. Uh, 
because like we see a lot of application bugs like like it comes as a framework why applications are crashing or why they are missing frames so we have a like decent understanding of problems we just don't have a decent understanding of writing an application so we kind of merge these two informations and try to come up with nicer things when we ask about the query builders when we saw that result it looked really weird so we, we ask again like why because in the voting you only vote like you don't really say why and the answer was no because it's like if the query is simple it's very easy to write the SQL anyways and if the query is complex like if you're joining tables then the builder actually looks like really ugly so it already looked bad like in both ways the builders don't really add anything it's that the studio can fix this so it's like in this example of like just joining two tables I mean this is not even readable and like all these ORMs like they try to mimic the SQLite API like the SQL query builder API but this is, doesn't look nice this looks much better in Kotlin though so. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm showing it in Java because I'm saying it's bad uh, so like you can just write it in a very easy way in SQL so we want you to write that one but we want to do something clever when you're trying it to map, map it back to Java like in this one uh, these elements are just some helper annotation, but this is okay, just a POJO. We want to work with POJOs. This is part of the uh, goal where we don't want this database solution to be too intrusive. Like it should be just something sidelines. So, but in relations though, we didn't implement. I mean, we implement something, but not uh, what other people do. And there is a like very strong reason behind this. I want to explain. So let's say you have a like a class like a feed, and then you have a user in your database. So usually a feed item is posted by a user, right? So we like to put a user here. And if you put this, room will say no, 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 you cannot put it there. Which basically means you cannot have an entity that contains another entity. So just, the room just doesn't allow it. And why is here? So let's say you have a DAO, like in the room, you write these data access objects. You say, I'm trying to select something from the feed table. And you're returning a feed. Now, when you return the feed, are we supposed to fetch the user or not? Like, there's a question that's not, it's not clear. When you see this code, you don't understand whether the user is being fetched or not, which is not nice because we want these things to be understandable. But most of the ORMs, if you look at them, the solution is usually or just do lazy loading, right? Like whenever get user is called, then go and fetch the user, which uh, in practice looks like a code like this where you have the user ID, which references the user table, and then you have a user inside your code. So when the get user is called, if it's the first time, you go and fetch it, otherwise you return from the cache. This looks all fine, and then you can do this on the server side, work very well but on the client side this is actually like a mine you planted in your application just looking forward to explode <coughs> we're gonna make it explode now so let's say you have this recycle video so you're working on let's say you're working on telegraph right you have this like text uh, news articles and have a title a subtitle and then you never fetch the user it worked very well and then the pm comes like Two months later, he says we should show the like whoever wrote this article, we should put their name. The developer is okay. That's so easy. Just say, you know, feed get user, put the name inside this. Is I might recycle the view when I try it. It works like it's it's going to work. It's actually this this is where you fail. Like this super simple code change, which no one would realize in uh, when you do the code review is actually causing a main thread query. You have no idea. And when you test it yourself, it's going to work fine. Because most of the time, your test device then, like, is actually a test device. First, it's not a real device. Second, it's probably a very good device. Third, nothing else is happening on that device at that point. So it's going to work. But when your user is using the application, it will just explode. And then, there, then you will start receiving these ANRs, or maybe you're just like missing frames it looks like and you're trying to understand and like if you think this doesn't happen and your disk is fast like it's very easy just try to tell that go to play store say update applications and try to use your phone you'll see how slow it gets like basically this flash disk on these devices are are slow so 
There is no such thing as I can do main thread queries because they are very fast. That doesn't exist. Like, if you are if you are potentially going to disk, you're just risking an error. Also, like for, on the main thread, so you're trying to catch 60 frames per second, which means you have 16 milliseconds, half of which is sent uh, spent in the render thread. So if you only have eight milliseconds and you spend two of it going to database, it's actually already very costly. You cannot do that, that's not a solution. What we tell people to do is, as well as a relational database, so why don't you just join? Uh, so you have the user ID, this is a, the way you would arrange your data normally, and then write the query. I just like, I say, I want title, subtitle, and username. I don't even want the whole user, I don't want the whole feed object, I just want these two columns from this table with this query. And when you say that first, it's much more efficient in terms of I.O. because you're only fetching what you need, and it's explicit. So next day when the, you know, the PM comes, wants one more field that you change your query. And then you can just return any portion. This doesn't need to be an entity or whatever. Like it's, it's just a data class. As long as it matches what the query returns, Room knows how to generate that code. And the very nice thing about this is when you write the query, we actually know which tables are you are querying. So you, you can say, return me a live data, or you can say, return me a like, IXG of a flowable. We will do that for you. We'll automatically make it observable because we know what you are querying. So it's so much better. So we tell people, if you want relations, instead of trying to backport this like Java references into SQL, just like embrace the relationships. You're not going to pay any hidden costs. It's all explicit. You only fetch what you need, so it's cheaper. And it's still observable. Like everything you need is there if you embrace this model instead of trying to hide the reality of SQL behind Java APIs. So this was like part of being opinionated. We said we are going to be opinionated while doing these projects. So it's like SQLite is the way to go because on every single device. Like I will enjoy writing a new database engine, but it's not really a feasible solution. Uh, we want to embrace it. And then Things like main thread databases, we just don't at all. Like, I mean, you can enable it. We let you like go around it in the builder, mostly like useful for testing. But otherwise, we will just crash, no matter if it's slow or not. We won't let you do that. Or the relations, like we don't want hidden calls. We want everything to be explicit. We want people to embrace how SQL works. And a similar thing is like these data access objects. We want you to write. This is a best practice when you're writing database things. So it's like you should write data access object, which makes it so much easier to test. And a part of the things we say, whatever we do is should play nice with each other, like the other libraries. So there's like no base class. You don't need to extend anything. We do support things like RxJava. Like we want these things to work nice. OK. So this last part is the architecture. This is a very sensitive topic on Android because like a while ago, Diane, if you don't know what who Diane is, like she single-handedly wrote most of the Android framework. So uh, she's pretty good. But she had this post where she said like, well, people keep asking us about architecture. We really have no idea, which might look really weird from your perspective. Like these, pers these people are writing the Android OS itself and they don't know how to write applications. It's weird. But I can tell you why it's happening that way. Like the stuff we do in the framework, when you're an engineer in the framework, you do these things like activity services, how the processes work with each other, how do you save battery. Like from operating systems perspective, it's a totally different story. Putting them together, like writing an application that uses these things with real life constraints, is just not something we do. Like that's not part of my job description. So of course, like we know how they should behave, but we really don't see the problems from the application's perspective as part of our daily job. And the result of this is, like, if you look at the overall Android ecosystem, there's really nice solutions to do certain tasks. Like if you want to fetch data from the server, yeah, just like use retrofit, which we didn't write, but it's, it's good. Like the solution is there. Or like you want to show a list of items, just use recycle -Avium. The solution is that like both of these work very well within themselves. But if you are trying to write a list that user can local modify and also sync with the server side, that's a very hard thing to do. So this is the result of this. Like 
us by ignoring the developer story, you end up in a like, half-baked ecosystem. So we're trying to fix that. So we're like, fine, we are going to provide architectural guidance. Uh, we do, I mean, there's many people inside the framework who worked on applications, so it's not like we don't know it. So, and then the question was, okay, people want guidance, but do they really want us to pick one of the, uh, like, any of these? Should we tell people to use MVP or clean architecture or wiper, whatever? Like, this was, this was one of the questions, and we couldn't agree, like we discussed about this, uh, we couldn't agree on, on a solution because like if we pick, if we tell people, you know what, go ahead and use MVVM, first it will be very easy to explain. You know, like there's a well-known architecture pattern, we wouldn't need to spend too much time on that. And then for the average developer, this is actually great because you know, like everything is set in that architecture pattern, they will just follow it, it will be much easier. But this comes with some disadvantages. Like, first of all, we all know that there is never like such this great architecture. It depends on your use case. All these solutions depend on your use case, so it will be bad for many cases. Or it's really against the open structure of Android. Like, you, like you, you, we don't want to force people to use something while we already know it's not necessarily the best. And like, you could easily come and argue with me. Like, I have this use case. You told me to use MVP, but I actually want to use clean architecture. Like, I cannot argue against that. But so, there was cons and pros, and we went, uh, we asked CAP, basically. So every time we cannot agree internally, we ask them. It's like our marriage council. Uh, it's like, we said, should we pick one of these? They were like, no, 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 no. Just provide the guidance. Like, the value we can add as part of the framework team is uh, things like, how your application should behave with the external work. If you, if you can provide a generic guidance on like how to write your application offline, you know, how to merge this network state with the local data, and then you can pick your favorite architecture depending on your team members or whatever is popular that month. So with this, with this so we had the prototypes for life cycles, room, and then like an architecture design doc. We did a code lab in March. Uh, we wrote code labs for these uh, components. As a, there was a two-day event that we <coughs> invited developers from all around the world. We gave them these code labs. We showed them the foo and the, like, the recommended architecture we are thinking about. Uh, we just talked with them. I like, I, when I say around the world, it's literally around the world. Like we were in Indonesia, Korea. Uh, and it, we do this because like, when you live in Silicon Valley, your life, like people around you is so much different than when you live in, let's say, India or Turkey or like London. Uh, so we want to understand that you'll see the priorities of people in different parts of the world is actually different. And like one of the discussions in this call was about architecture because like architecture is something like this. As your application, like architecture gets more complex as your application becomes like more real world. But it's, it's after some point, is diminishing returns. And we are trying to find this like right point, which will be the basic guideline that you will find on developer Android com. But it's very hard to decide. And initially, we had something like this, actually. We said, you know what? OK, the biggest problem we have is these God activities, where people put too much code into these activities. We want to stop that. And then we came up with the V model and the live data. And we're going to tell people, you know what? Put that code into the V model. and then do the communication with the model and the business logic. And like people who attended this call at this are, no, you know what, like you will get a lot of God activity and you will create God view models. <laughs> so first of my answer to this is so much better, I'm happy. <laughs> like, because like God activity is we kill it. Like view models, if you leak a view model, it's not the end of the world. Uh, so it's much better, but they were like, no, 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 no. just like try to make it a little bit clear so we came, we edit this repository to like explain people that you know like there needs to be a good API between your data layer and the rest of your application. That's your repository. By the way, like any anything else you add makes it a lot more complex for the average Joe. So like adding one more component here has a significant cost for us. So like not adding that for was a reason, but we thought okay, it's worth the cost. And then we started sending this uh, around Apple. We started sending the pre-builds of these libraries to people. 
and I will start doing API reviews. And like, I want to talk about the other thing. I want to show you like some things are changing inside the framework. Some pragmatic or practical uh, choice we made in these API reviews. There are no enums on Android, right? So we do everything like this. Like this is an int def, like all the states are defined as an integer. It's really a flag, it also makes sense. But then the API console came and said, you know what, no, just make it an enum. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm like>, oh. <laughs> That's like, you can understand, like we, when, once we start looking at the problem from the developer's perspective, not the operating system's perspective, your priorities change. We are, we are happy to eat the cost of additional enum because it will make it much easier for the developer when they see that class. Then I go, look, what is an in depth? Like, think about the Java developer. So, and I owe we ship alpha one, which I was very scared of it turned out very well. Like, people seem to like it. We did four more releases after that, which is quite unnormal for Android. But we want to keep doing these things because we are looking for feedback. Like, if you look at what's next, you just keep iterating until one o. We want to reach the one o, but like reaching the one of means a commitment, so we want to be sure. Uh, so it's like room has some missing features, we want to implement those things. We're in life cycles, we are still playing with the rules around how these events are called. Uh, we, we are talking a lot with the community, actually that was the reason why I came to London, we are doing a round table event, and like talking to developers who actually use these things, and trying to learn from their experience. Uh, like I, I read, Everybody in the team, like we read everything on the internet that people publish around architecture conferences. Like I, I'm on Reddit like 10 times a day looking for what's coming out, what people are saying. It really matters because that's what we are looking for right now. Like, is this working? Uh, and if it's not, we want to fix it. And if and once we believe we receive enough feedback, we are going to call this 1.0, and then, and then that will be the next. We want to finish this full. Uh, full is like we started running cold labs right now, so we have a plan to make it like alpha one soonish as well. It'll take a while. We started working on one more component because <laughs> we didn't have enough work. Uh, but like, this, it's like we're just trying to find the problems we should be tackling. We're trying to see how people use the current components and learn from that. Uh, it's just prototyping right now. But that's the idea. We're trying to build all these components or like start blessing public libraries. Uh, but we need feedback. Like we really, really need feedback. Actually, we have a feedback link too. So <laughs> like if you ever use these things, if you have ideas, like uh, uh, many people from the team are in London this week. And we have time. Like we would like to talk. So you can go fill out that form there. Just fill this out. Come talk to us. We would appreciate all your help. And thank you.